There are nine students in a class, three of which they come from the Department of Psychology, three of them they come from the Department of Physics, three of them are from the Department of Statistics. And so these are the nine students in the class. So now we want to ask how many ways can we make them stand in a line such that there are no three consecutive students from the same department. So I guess an application of this could be if you want students from different departments to co-mingle and like talk to each other and you don't really want them all from the same department, you want them all um, kind of from different departments. I'll call the psychology students department A, the physics ones department B, and the statistics ones we can call them department C. And so what we do not want is all three of them standing next to each other. An example of what that would look like would be if you had all of the physics students and all of the stats students and then all of the psych students standing next to each other in the line. We do not want something like this. We also don't want something like two stats students and two physics students, then all of the department of psychology students, and then we would have the last ones of physics and stats students. We also don't want something like this. Even though the physics and stats students are separated, we still have the department of psychology students all standing next to each other in the line, and so that's something that we don't want. And so going back to our problem statement, the number of ways we can make them stand in the line without three consecutive students from the same department next to each other. So of course there's a lot of different ways that we can make lines that we don't want, but how many would fit this solution, what we do want? And so a cool thing that we can use here, a concept that we learned in class, would be the inclusion-exclusion principle. So let's talk about that. So just giving an overview of what this principle is talking about, it's saying that if we define some sort of properties or a set of characteristics, we can just call the set P for properties. And if we have some number of properties, well, if we can define all these properties, and this is what we do not want in our final solution, then we can take different combinations of these properties and subtract them from our total set. So what this would look like would be some sample space, so let's just call it x has some size x, and we have all of our properties. So we'll call this property p1, say we have another property, let's call it p2, we have another one, p3, and it overlaps with p1, p5 might be here, and so on for however many numbers of properties that we have. And so uh, in a question such as in our problem statement where we want to exclude something, uh, we can actually find the properties such that it includes whatever we don't want and then we can exclude what we don't want from our final solution. So going back here, what that would look like would be all of our properties being what we don't want. So what we do want is everything else. So it'd be everything outside of all of these properties. And so with inclusion and exclusion, first we'll include all the properties. We'll find out what this, the value of whatever our properties are within our sample space. Then we'll exclude all this green stuff from the total set. So how do we find what this green stuff is? Uh, you know, there's all these like kind of weird intersections where, you know, if you take this one out and then this one out, you're kind of overlapping here. So you're like double counting. And, and for some number m of properties, you know, you might have a ton of different intersections. So how do you account for not double counting when you subtract those intersections? Well, a cool thing that we can do, kind of going back to something that I talked about when I TA'd for probability and statistics, let's take this simple Venn diagram, for example. And so let's just call this P1 and P2, and this is our total set. And so we can notice here that if we subtract P1 once, then P2 once, we're actually subtracting the intersection, which is this region here, twice. And we don't want to double count or we don't want to subtract it twice. So what we need to do is add it back once. And that's exactly what you do for a problem like this in like a probability and statistics class. I'll link a video to where I talked about that somewhere here. <laughs> um, I hope that works. Maybe it'll be here uh, whenever I am editing this video in future, Brittany. But yeah, so going back to inclusion, exclusion principle, you're going to be adding and subtracting back all these intersections, you know, like triple intersections and quadruple intersections. So for example, we can use our problem statement. So in this problem, uh, we want to make sure that there are no three consecutive students. And so our properties would be the reverse positive of that. So it'd be the three psychology students are standing next to each other, the three physics students are standing next to each other, and the three statistics students are standing next to each other. And these are the properties that we want to exclude because in the end, we don't want them standing next to each other. So our properties would be the fact that they are standing next to each other, and then we would exclude that from the total. So let me write that real quick. 
Great, so if we have some property set P, which consists of three properties, P1, P2, and P3, you can say that property one is that all the psychology students are standing next to each other in line, so it'd be the same condition, and this is eventually what we want to exclude. All right, so another way to kind of like abstract this problem and think about it in what I deem as like an easier way to conceptualize it is now we have these nine letters. We have AAA, which stands for the three psychology students, we have B, 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 the three physics students, and we have C, 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 the three statistics students. So if this is our set of all nine students, now how many ways can we arrange each of these letters into a single word or a single line such that there are no three same letters next to each other? You know, so in this case, instead of talking about students, we have letters, three of which are A's, three are B's, and three are C's. And so we want to see how many ways we can arrange these nine letters into unique words such that there are no three next to each other. And so now talking about inclusion exclusion principle, and we'll take the total. So the total number of ways that we can arrange all of these with no restrictions. Let's say that we have nine letters total, so nine factorial, but we have to divide it by some value that accounts for there being multiples of the same letter, A, 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 for example. And all these A's, they're non-unique repetitions of the same letter. This A is not unique from this A, which is not unique from that A. Um, so we need to account for all these A's being non-unique. Unique. Uh, so we'll divide it by 3 factorial to account for that. Similarly, for the B's, we had B, B, and B. You know, these students are from the same department. Uh, these are all the same letter B. And so we also have to account for these non-unique repetitions of the letter B. And there are three of them, so we'll divide again by 3 factorial. Um, and similarly for C, divide again by 3 factorial. So this is the total number of arrangements that we have without any restrictions. Now we have to subtract all of the combinations of properties that we don't want. So first we'll start with the case that only one of these properties is existent. So for example, that all the three A students are next to each other, and we don't really care about these other two properties just yet. We're only concerned about the first one. And so for example, what this will look like, let's grab a new sheet of paper, and I'll keep this underneath because we're going to come back to this in just a second, just to show you what it looks like when we only consider property one. This is a case that all the A students are next to each other. So going back to our set of letters that we have, A, 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 we have B, 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 C, C, C. So we're concerned with all the A's standing next to each other. So let's treat this as one unit in which we can arrange these now seven letters, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, into unique words. And so we have all the A's standing next to each other. So for example, you know, we have three of the A students standing next to each other in this line of nine students. And so we can kind of shift this three set of A's all around when we arrange this word in, in a unique number of ways. And so since we now have seven units, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, this will be seven factorial. We'll have to divide again by three factorial, another three factorial, each of these which count for the three non-unique repetitions of the letter B and the three non-unique repetitions of the letter C. And so this is concerning only property one. And we also have to do this for property two. For example, all the B students are next to each other. So we have the set of letters, uh, but now we want all the B students to stand next to each other. So we can treat this as one unit and we'll arrange all of these seven units, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, into some number of unique words What well, could be um, an example where we have all the B students next to each other and all the C and A students are spread out. And so this is just one example, um, but you can have many of them, again, which would be seven factorial all over three factorial, which accounts for the three non-unique repetitions of A and another three factorial, which accounts for the non-unique three repetitions of the letter C. And so you'll do this for each property. So here we just did it for property two where all the B students are next to each other. So we saw it here. Then on this sheet of paper, we did it for all the A students next to each other, which is property one. Similarly, we'll do it again for all the C students standing next to each other. Going back to here, we're gonna subtract exactly what we don't want. So we don't want the students next to each other. So we're gonna subtract that. We'll say three choose one, since we're choosing one property each time out of the three. So three choose one. And as we saw here, for example, where all the B students are next to each other, considering property two will be 7 factorial over 3 factorial times 3 factorial. So this is counting for single properties at a time. All right, so, you know, it kind of looks like we're done, but we have to be really careful because 
we actually double or say even triple counted some of the intersections or overlaps here. So we have three properties, right? Property one, two, and three. So let me draw this like a Venn diagram. So we're writing out our equation, our total. I'm just gonna call it x for simplicity on this. This is our total set, our total sample space. And what are three properties, one, two, and three. What we wish to find is all this stuff out here. And what we wish to exclude is this space here. However, when we're subtracting our single properties, we include the entirety of each property. And so we are actually subtracting this whole thing as property one, and we subtract all of property two. Lastly, we subtract all of property three. And as you can kind of see, uh, there's some overlap. So we actually, you know, subtracted these intersections either twice or even three times. So we have to somehow add it back. Let's do that by adding back our double properties. So what does this look like? That's a good question. <laughs> so let's figure it out. So when we're concerned with double properties, we want to have the case that we choose two of these three properties. So for example, we can choose P1 and P2, or we could choose another two properties, say P3 and P1, where we choose two properties. From our three properties, we'll choose two. So three choose two. So let's take a look at this. So again, back to our nine students, let's say that we choose properties one and three. Again, you can choose different combinations of two properties within these three. But let's just say we choose one and three. So all the A students are next to each other and all the C students are next to each other. So let's treat all the A students next to each other as one unit, uh, and then all the C students next to each other as another unit. And so how many units do we have that we need to arrange? One, two, three, four, five. Five factorial over, and now we need to count for how many repetitions that we have of non-unique letters that we need to arrange. And for this case, it'll just be the Bs. So all these three Bs, they're not unique from each other, so we'll divide this by 3 factorial. And so an example of what an arrangement of this could look like would be, so all the A students are next to each other, and all the C students are next to each other, and all the B students are apart. Another example of this could be, or again, all the A students and all the C students are next to each other. The B students are still spread apart. And so, you know, you can have some number of combinations for this, which will be 5 factorial over 3 factorial. And so now going back to our Venn diagram, we added back all of the double properties, but we still have this centers part. And so we actually need to subtract it one more time. So we'll subtract some triple case. And so what does our triple case look like? Well, this is a case that all three of the properties are true. If we have the set of all of our letters, aka representing all of our students. Well, our triple case would be that all three properties are true. So all the A students are next to each other, all the B students are next to each other, and all the C students are next to each other. So this is really, you can think of it as three units that we want to arrange. One, two, and three. So if we want to arrange these three in three different ways, that'll be three factorial. An example of what this could be could look like you know, where all the B, C, and A students are next to each other. In other words, we took these units and just rearranged them in different ways. We could also have, you know, again, all the C, A, and B students are next to each other. It looks like we just took these three units and rearranged them around. And so the number of ways we can do that, where we have all three properties being true. So in other words, of the three properties that we have, we choose three to be true. So all the properties are true. And we see that we have three unique uh, units that we want to rearrange. So that'll be three factorial. And so this will be the number of triple ways in our um, triple intersection, which is, you know, this area right in the middle of our three properties. Let's add that into our final equation. So, you know, three of properties, we choose three to be true. In other words, all of them are true. Then we multiply it by three factorial, the number of ways to arrange those unique letter units. And so this is our final solution. This is the number of ways we can have nine students from you know three different departments to not stand next to each other all in the same line so let's kind of look at this again say like why does this make sense because it does still look like a bunch of numbers and just stuff um <laughs> but here let me grab a different color all right so let's break it down here we have our total here's our entire set 
So again, I can draw this out. So we have in brown our entire total. And our total we can represent as, be, you know, being the size of uh, the magnitude of x. You know, if x is representing our entire sample space. And then from our problem statement, we have three unique properties that we want to exclude. Again, these are our properties. Property 1, property 2, property 3. Um, and so we want to exclude these properties. The property 1 being, you know, all the A students are next to each other. But in our problem statement, we don't want them to be next to each other. So we'll take this property and exclude it. Say we have property 1, which we want to eventually exclude. Uh, we also can do the same for property 2 and property 3. And this is P3. Our properties are things that we do not want. So what we do want to find is all this space outside of our properties. This is what we do want. And so if somehow we can find the total, this entire sample space, and if we can find our total property space, so all of this stuff, well, if we can subtract this from the total, then we'll get all this green stuff. I mean, intuitively, uh, that makes sense. And so that's exactly what we did here. So we took the total in brown, so total being in brown, and we subtracted all the rest being our like property space. And so yeah, that's exactly what we did. We subtracted our property space, which is all of this stuff. And so this is representing all of this. And the way that we find this is by subtracting each property, then we have to account for the double counting of subtracting and adding back, subtracting and adding back, etc. all of the intersection spaces. So again, we take the total in brown, take the total, subtract our property space. Yeah, so this is our final solution. You can work this out with a calculator, but this is fundamentally how you would get to the answer. All right, hey, it's me, Brittany, editing from the future, um, but I forgot to film an outro. Um, anyways, I felt like this concept was really cool because it takes something pretty abstract, just like a concept, how do we count a certain number of ways to do something, and we can actually have a pretty logical like flow and approach to counting it, um, which I thought was very cool because for like when I first approached a problem, I had no idea how to solve something like this with all these different conditions and properties, um, but there's actually like a really nice flow to figuring out. And uh, yeah, I hope this explanation made sense. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time.